Okay, so today's topic is principal co-analysis, or PCA. So PCA is a super useful technique for what's called dimensionality reduction. So a lot of times you have a data set in which the input variables are high dimensional, right? So you may have, you know, if you're talking about an image, right, you may have like a 100 by 100 image, even that is a pretty small image, right? But uh, that means there are 10,000 pixels of information. And the question is, you know, do you really need all 10,000 of those pixels to convey the important stuff that's in that image, right? And so this is basically a unsupervised learning technique that helps us discover what directions in the underlying feature space are really that important for looking at our data, right? So just let's take an example of uh, character recognition, and I'll kind of come back to this throughout the lecture as an example, right? So say we are looking at, you know, handwritten characters, right? So, you know, I may write a three like this, and you may write a three like this, and someone may be using a really thick pen to write their three, so their three may be thicker, and whatnot, right? So again, if this image is like 100 by 100, in theory, there are 10,000 degrees of freedom in this set of pixels, right? But we know that under the hood, there can't possibly be that many different degrees of freedom in how people draw threes, right? Um, we, un we, we have a sense that the underlying kind of space of threes is much lower dimensional than 10,000, right? That is, not every one of these pixels can independently change in order to make a three, right? There are only some combinations of pixels that, that can add up to make a three, right? So the question is basically how many degrees of freedom are really in our data set. Okay, so to take it to an extreme, let's suppose that I only had one three, suppose I was a robot that always wrote three in the same way, and the only variation that I might see is something like, you know, I could have uh, translation, meaning that it might appear differently in the image. Maybe I have a little bit of rotation because if I scan the envelope wrong, or maybe I have different aspects of size, right? But if I think about the variations, there's really only like XY translation, one degree of rotation, and one degree of how big the character is, I can imagine that really there are only like four underlying degrees of freedom in how this robot might, you know, draw this three, okay? And so that's the idea is how do we discover what those underlying degrees of freedom are? And so this is a, um, you know, the underlying, you know, degrees of freedom, DOF, are also called latent variables. And you may have heard this word before. In fact, I know that when we had the graduate students talking on Monday, that one of them mentioned the latent space and latent variables. So this is kind of what we're talking about here is a reduction of dimensionality from the high dimensions that we have the raw data in to some lower number of dimensions that really control what's going on. And so, so much of machine learning these days is discovering the latent space for different things, right? So for example, if I want to use Dolly to draw pictures of cats. I want to have some sort of like a, a latent space that corresponds to cat pictures and lets me make different cats by turning these knobs, right? So um, in practice, you know, um, what we want to do is uh, use this PCA thing for both discovering the latent space and also you can think about it kind of like a compression technique, right? So uh, if you're a really hardcore signal processing person, which I don't think many of you are, you may have heard something called the Carhoun and Lev transform, which is basically just a fancy word for PCA. Um, and so this is useful in general for lots of different fields. Um, and so here's the idea. What we wanna do is we have, you know, N observations. x1 through xn, and each of these observations is in some d-dimensional space. So this is like some big number. And the goal is to project 
the data onto a space with dimension called M that is much lower than D. And what is our kind of cost function for this? You know, the, the cost function is basically, or the objective function maybe is a better way to say it. The objective function that we want is to maximize the variance of the projected data. And a little picture, I think, will make that clear. And so in a way, this should remind you a little bit of when we talked about Fisher's discriminant, right? So what we were doing with Fisher's discriminant was we were finding one dimension of the space that we could basically project the data on that was good in some sense, right? Now, Fisher and PCA are not the same thing, but there's this kind of idea of projection, right? So we're going to use the same concept. So let me just start with a kind of a toy example in 2D, right? So suppose that we had, you know, here's my, my XY space. And suppose I had a bunch of data. And the data was kind of clustered around like this. I guess I have it going through the origin, but it doesn't have to, right? So, and now I say, okay, I want you to find one axis that will do the best job of representing the variation in the data, right? So if I think about it, you know, I could project all the data down onto the x-axis, in which case I would have a spread like this, or I could project all the data onto the y-axis, in which case I have a spread like this. But kind of what I want to do is intuitively find this line here, right? The idea being that what I'm trying to do is to say that if I looked at projecting data onto this line, I would have the widest amount of variance. And kind of conversely, perpendicular to the line, there should be little variance, right? So if I think about it, what I want to do is I want to you know, look at all of these right angle distances here and make those as small as possible. Or conversely, I want the spread of data along the axis that I choose to be as wide as possible, right? So Kind of the idea is, you know, um, let's choose a unit vector u and project data onto it. So let's think about how that works, right? So let's suppose that I have. Um, some data, and I guess I can use this picture, but let me just draw a new picture just to be, you know, a little bit clearer. So let's suppose that I have, you know, just this quadrant, and here is my um, unit vector u, and I kind of extend that out into space like this. And so now let's suppose that I have my data out here. And the average of the data is somewhere out here in the original space, right? Now, any projection of one of these points onto this unit vector u is just x transpose u, right? So, you know, projection is, you know, x transpose u. This is projection onto, you know, u. So that's like saying that I go from a point x to a point here, which is x transpose u. And then the corresponding point here is the mean of x projected onto u. Okay. So this is kind of like saying this mean after I choose a u and project is like taking, you know, um, or, you know, I could also call this u transpose x, same thing. This is like u transpose the average of all of the x's. I guess I have, a, I have a 1 over n, right? OK. And now, once I've got this stuff set up, I can ask, OK, well, what is the variance of the points on this line, right? So that's like saying, what is the squared error from the mean? So I'm trying to now measure 
the basically sum of squares of these distances here. Okay, so let's compute that. What we're saying here, I'm going to just leave this kind of like up on here for a second. So, so the variance of the projected data is like saying I want to uh, average the sum of squares of each data point from the mean. Okay. And now I'm just going to expand out what this means. This is like saying uh, I have 1 over n times this sum. Then I'm going to pull the u transpose out like this. And then I'm going to kind of do a sneaky way of putting this together here. So like this is a this is a scalar, this is a scalar. When I put it together in this way, I can kind of write this in a form that looks like this. Or pulling the u out entirely. like this. And so in this way, what I have here is remember that, you know, I'm in d dimensional space, right? So this thing is a d by one vector. This here is a one by d vector. This here is a bunch of uh, d by 1 times 1 by d vectors. This here in the middle is like a d by d matrix. But the whole thing is just a number, right, that says how much variance is there along that axis. And this thing here in the middle should remind you of something, right, because we saw matrices, or we saw this kind of sum over data points that looks very much like this. This is like exactly how you would estimate like the sample covariance of a Gaussian, right? So like if you're trying to fit a Gaussian to data and you're trying to find the sigma, we had this formula probably somewhere earlier in the class where we we're trying to estimate the covariance matrix, right? So here, a different way of writing this is like, you know, u transpose sigma u, where this here is what we call the data covariance matrix. And, you know, you should have something in the back of your mind that says, oh yeah, I kind of remember that. Okay, so now I have the thing that I want to maximize, right? So questions or comments so far? Okay, so I want to maximize this. Now again, you know, I'm maximizing with respect to you, right? So all the, all the things that depend on the data are stuck inside this sigma. So all I have to do kind of to start out with is form this covariance matrix, which is like saying, find the mean of x, subtract off the mean, and look at basically the x minus x mean times itself transpose, right? And so this is where all the data is. This is what I want to maximize. If I didn't have the constraint that u was a unit vector, then I could just make u bigger and bigger, and I wouldn't have the problem. So instead, I have to kind of constrain my world to say u is a unit vector, right? So the more proper way of, of posing the problem is, so we want to maximize u transpose sigma u subject to the constraint that u is a unit vector, right? We need this to make sure that things don't blow up. And again, we talked about how do you solve these constraint optimization problems. We've already done a few things like this in class. The way you do it is with Lagrange multipliers, right? So kind of what you say is, you know, via Lagrange multipliers, I can turn this constrained problem into an unconstrained problem where I'm saying I want to maximize the thing here, plus I have a, you know, Lagrange multiplier. Actually, for the moment, let me just call this alpha, even though normally I call it lambda, but there's a reason I don't want to do that. So here, let's call this alpha. No, I'm actually, screw it. Let's call it lambda. It's a nice day. So let's call this lambda. And then 
I basically subtract off how much am I violating the constraint. Rinsing, right? So this I want to be 0, but I'm going to penalize how much I am off from 0. And so now I'm going to take the derivative of this function and set equal to 0, right? So that's what I do if I want to maximize with respect to, to u. So to maximize with respect to u, well, again, we know the vector derivatives by now, right? So uh, the gradient with respect to u, take the gradient with respect to u and set equal to 0. So the gradient here is 2 sigma u. The gradient here is uh, minus lambda 2 u. Set that equal to 0. And now if I rearrange things, what I get is sigma u equals lambda u. Okay, I still don't know lambda, but uh, I have this relationship between sigma, lambda, and mu. Okay? And so, who knows what this relationship is? Yes? Uh, eigenvalues. eigenvalues, yes. So this is an eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition, right? So if you took calculus, which I'm sure you did, you would have seen this idea, right? So this is basically saying that, you know, u is an eigenvector of sigma, and lambda is an eigenvalue. And again, in a way, it's kind of good that I left this as lambda, because lambda is often what we use to talk about eigenvalues, right? So now we know is that the u that we want, the, the thing that we're projecting on, is one of the eigenvectors of this sigma. And so which eigenvector should we take? Well, now we have to figure out which is the right one to take, right? So um, one thing that we can do is basically, uh, remember what we wanted to do was maximize this thing in the first place, right? So let me multiply both sides on this thing by u transpose. So, you know, if we multiply by u transpose on both sides, what I see is u transpose sigma u equals lambda u transpose u. This thing, by definition, is 1 because it's a unit vector. And so what this tells us is that really what we're trying to do is just trying to maximize lambda. Right? Because this is my objective function. And this drops out to 1. So this is like saying, find the lambda that maximizes you know, itself, right? So the cool result is that uh, we should take uh, u to be the eigenvector of this data covariance sigma that corresponds to the largest eigenvalue, which is easy to do. You can show that, by the way, I made this covariance matrix. Like you should remember, hopefully, from probability and statistics, that you know these covariance matrices have to have eigenvalues that are positive or at least zero and positive, right? Which means that I'm not going to have any negative eigenvalues or complex eigenvalues. So we can show that you know sigma has real eigenvalues that are all greater than or equal to zero. So it's not hard to find the one that we want. Okay. And so this, you know, this special U is called the first principal component. And so that tells us that if I gave you only one vector to project onto, it should be this first principal component, right? Which I get by forming the covariance matrix out of the data, using a linear algebra package to take the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and then just taking the one that corresponds to the biggest lambda. And as a bonus, that big lambda 
tells me how much variance there is in that direction, right? And oftentimes, we don't want to just take the biggest eigenvalue. We also want to just look for, OK, if I want to reduce the dimensionality of my data from d down to some number, I'm going to take the m largest eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors, and those are going to be my principal components. So let me write that down. So if we want more than one you know, principal component, say we want m, we just take the m eigenvectors of sigma corresponding to the m largest eigenvalues. Lambda 1, dot, 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 lambda m. And so you know, I have basically a set of you know, u's, and I have a set of lambdas. And so the nice thing is that that means that that is the best m-dimensional subspace that I can get to represent the data, right? So this you know, subspace spanned by the eigenvectors is optimal in the sense of maximizing the variance. Or like I said, I think a different way to think about it, which is a little more intuitive, is that you know, uh, the sum of the squared errors to the subspace is minimized. Right, so that's a different way of thinking about it, but it's the same thing in the end, which is saying that if I look at my uh, picture here, what I want to do is I want to project the dots onto the line in such a way that the sum of these red sticks is as small as possible, right? And so it's an intuitive idea. It's easy to implement, works really well. Um, you know, one, one comment is that, in a way, it may seem like, what's the difference between this line and the line that I get from regression, right? So let me just do a little side note. So side note is that, you know, PCA isn't the same as linear regression. And the reason for that is that if I have a bunch of dots, in the plane, right? And I fit and I consider a line, right? So PCA is basically, like I said, I'm trying to m minimize the distances of these points perpendicular to the line, right? So PCA is basically distances, I'm going to minimize the distances perpendicular to the line. Whereas with regression, what I'm doing is I have a model like y equals some function of x, which means that I'm minimizing distances that look like this, right? I'm minimizing distances in the you know, y-axis, right? So linear regression is I'm minimizing you know, the differences between y and, you know, this, right? So these are not perpendicular to the line. They are up and down in the y direction, right? So, you know, again, there's no necessarily right or wrong, but I think that in general, you know, if you're trying to do dimensionality reduction, you wouldn't do it with regression. You would do it with PCA, because what you're trying to do is find that best line. And again, a nice way of thinking about PCA also is it's just a change of coordinates, right? So one nice thing about these eigenvectors is they're all perpendicular to each other, right? That's another property of this covariance matrix. So, or just the property general of, of eigenvectors, right? So um, the eigenvectors in general are all mutually perpendicular, 
which means that you know uh, PCA is like a change of coordinates. And I, I always find that from a linear algebra perspective, that's a really constructive way to think about things. Um, so it's kind of like saying, OK, you know, if I gave you these original points, I can just kind of rotate my you know, plane in such a way that I try to make the distance along my new x-axis, you know, the variance there should be as y as possible. And then kind of, or a different way of thinking about it is that the variance on the other axis should be as small as possible, right? So it's just like saying, all I'm doing is I'm describing, you know, now this picture with, you know, instead of x and y, I have two new numbers, right? u1 and u2. So I could give a coordinate of a point in terms of x comma y or u1 comma u2. And the idea of PCA is that, in theory, all of those u's, you know, the, the, the further down I go on the list of u's, the smaller those numbers should be because I'm removing the variance in those dimensions, right? And so that's, I think, a really useful way of thinking about things, is that it's kind of like going from, you know, xy space, where the data looks like this to u1, u2 space, where the data looks like this, right? So I haven't changed the shape of the data. All I'm doing is I'm, I'm talking about a different coordinate system. Yeah? Well, I just wanted to make a note that when I draw a picture like this, it looks a lot like fitting a line to the points. Right? But that's not really what I'm doing here. Right? What I'm doing instead is I'm trying to solve a different problem. Right? I'm not actually trying to minimize the distances in this direction. I'm trying to minimize the distances in that direction. Right? So you know, I wouldn't fit a, uh, so one of the reasons is it's different is that linear regression always kind of requires me to have a output variable and then a bunch of input variables that are related to that output. Right? Like y is a function of x, right? Here, I'm treating the xy points as just their own thing, right? There's no outputs and inputs. There's just like points in the plane, right? So this is like an unsupervised problem, right? That no one variable is more important than anything else, right? And so while I could also say, okay, well, if I want to fit a plane to the points, I could use linear regression to do that. But I'd still be making a choice about saying, okay, I think that z is a function of x and y, right? And I'm trying to minimize the distances in the z world versus trying to minimize the distances of the points to the plane, that's PCA, right? So, you know, it kind of depends what you're doing. If you're, if you're solving a problem where there is a natural output variable and you're trying to use the relationship between that and the input variables, then that's what regression is for, right? If you're trying to take a data set that has no output variable and try to find the best, most compact representation of it, that's what PCA is for, right? So hopefully that helps. OK, so let me just kind of show you um, an example of this in, um, you know, in MATLAB here. So um, I loaded up a uh, bunch of digits just from the MNIST data set again. And so here, I wrote a function. I mean, there's nothing really interesting in that function because the MATLAB function is called PCA, right? So there was a little bit of input preprocessing to get the data into the right format. And I had to take each of these uh, 28 by 28 characters and shape them into a long vector. And then I had basically 10,000. So let me just write this down for a second. So, um, you know, kind of like the, the MNIST example. So I basically have a, approximately 1,000 examples of 28 by 28, you know, pictures of threes or twos or fours or whatever, right? The MNIST testing data set has like 10,000 total examples. They're roughly split across the 10 classes, right? So what I want to do is I turn this into a matrix that looks like um, something like this, right? So I have um, 1,000 examples in this direction, and I have 760 for, I think, is 28 squared examples in this direction, right? So this direction is, you know, each of these corresponds to, no, sorry, each of these corresponds to one data sample, right? And then my covariance matrix will be 
I don't think it's seven. Maybe it's seven eighty-four. That seems better. Seven eighty-four by seven eigenvectors, eigenvectors right? And then my eigenvector eigenvectors are going to be basically seven eighty-four by one-dimensional vectors, right? And then after I get the eigenvectors, I reshape them back into twenty-eight by twenty-eight images. And so that's what I'm doing in this example over here is here I just looked at the classes 2, 3, and 4, okay? And so here these are the mean images, right? So the first thing I have to do is compute x bar, which is the average of all of the uh, data sets that I have, right? So I've kind of took, taken the 2s by themselves and the 3s by themselves and the 4s by themselves and I said, okay, what does the average two look like? It looks like this. What does the average three look like? What does the average four look like, right? So they look like twos, threes, and fours. And the interesting part is then saying, okay, what does the first principal component look like? The first principal component basically says, what is the degree of highest variation in the data set? So here you can see that if you get lucky, the PCA coefficients or the PCA uh, vectors kind of can be interpreted as the natural variations of the data, right? So for example, here, this difference is kind of saying that I've got, you know, kind of the, the difference between a two that's got a loop on the lower left and a two that's got a straight edge on the lower left, right? Because I'm, I'm kind of seeing a little variation between this, this kind of black shadow of a, of a sharp edge two and a loopy two, right? Uh, this one maybe looks like the difference between a two where you write your two kind of scrunched in the uh, vertical direction and versus making it a little bit wider, right? So not everything is that interpretable, but many of them are, right? So for example, this three is kind of like conveying something about tilt, right? So it's like saying some people draw their threes kind of tilted to the right, and some people draw their threes tilted to the left. Or this one is more like how wide is your three, right? Like is it narrow or is it wide? Um, in fours, right, you can kind of see that, you know, again, there's like some things that look a little bit like the difference between a slanted four and an up and down four. And this one, you can also kind of see poking through the difference between a four where someone draws the top like a triangle versus someone who leaves it open like a square, right? So the kind of cool thing is that we see these kind of discovered natural important variations in our data. And now if I said, okay, all I can give you is four numbers to represent a digit, how would you do it, right? The thing that you do is to say, okay, I'm gonna represent a new digit by this mean image plus a coefficient times this, a coefficient times this, and this and this, right? So it's like saying, now I could reduce my dimension down to four dimensions by taking the mean value plus four coefficients times these new basis vectors, right? And so that's the kind of cool thing is that uh, I could now generate a new data sample, right? So for example, here is just a, a case where I could say, okay, let's suppose that I wanna make a new two, right? I take the average two, which is mu i of two, and then I'm going to take a random number times the first 10 coefficients of twos, right? So here I've, I've reduced my dimensionality down to 10. And then I'm gonna reshape what I get into an image. If I do that, what I end up getting is a new candidate two. Now this two does not look that great, right? Let's try it again. Again, since these are random numbers, I'm just making a new two every time, right? So there's a new two, here's a new two, Here's new two, let's try this with threes. Right, here's an average, here's a three, it looks okay. This three has a little bit of extra crap on the right hand side. But again, one thing to think about is that, you know, the original data set was 28 by 28, right? 764, you know, numbers, right? Now I'm using only 10 numbers to make this new data set and the results look like threes, more or less. If I was to turn the number of principal components up, I would make more and more accurate looking threes, right? But still, it's pretty clear I don't need all 28 by 28 possible pixel values to generate the family of things that look like threes, right? So this is a really important result. And one of the reasons it's important is because this is maybe not, I don't know if it's your first example, but it is a critical example of what's called a generative model, right? Everyone's heard of generative AI, right? So this is a generative model for making new digits, right? So kind of key, you know, key observations or key whatever observations, yeah. If we're lucky, the principal components hopefully 
have some, you know, semantic interpretation. Right? So for example, you know, in the digit case, what we kind of saw was that, you know, variation number one was two versus two, right? And variation number two was kind of like, you know, two versus two, and so on. Something where you kind of see that there's hopefully something that you can pick out as a human and say, oh, okay, you know, this is how these things vary. And then the key idea is that we can now generate new examples of the, uh, you know, new examples, maybe I should say, that look like they come from the data distribution. Right? How I do that is to say I make a new example x by taking the mean and by adding to it, you know, some number of things where these here are this is the mean image or the mean vector. These here are the principal components. And these here are coefficients that I can tune. So this is an example of a simple generative model that is controlled by a small number of latent variables, right? So that's, those are some great words to know if you want to learn about generative models, right? So this is a, you know, example of a generative model. And there's a distinction between generative models and discriminative models, right? So almost everything we've done so far has been what I would call discriminative, right? So if I can, I can use a neural network or an SVM to build a great classifier, right? That's something that, that classifies threes really well. But I, then I can't ask that classifier, what makes a three? Or can you make me a new three, right? That's not what the classifier is able to do. But with PCA, as a generative model, I can make new threes, right? And that's exactly what is under the hood of like, if I wanna not make threes, but I wanna make, you know, cats wearing party hats in Dali, that's a generative model too, right? Where I have a, I have a thing I'm saying, sample from the distribution of cats wearing party hats, right? So that's something that we'll get into a little bit more uh, when I talk a little bit about generative AI in one lecture coming up, right? Um, but this is really, you know, kind of like the, the key idea. And again, if I'm trying to do a problem, and I'll show you an example from, from my research many years ago, um, where uh, if I'm trying to fit a model to data, it's a lot easier for me to just tweak these lambdas, some small number of lambdas, than it is to try to modify the entire, you know, thing in X space, right? So if I'm trying to fit, you know, a three to some data, I might do so by just saying, okay, what are the best lambda one, two, three, four, five that make the image look like, you know, the data that I have versus trying to change all 28 by 28 pixels to make it work. Yeah. Yeah, so how would I choose the amount of principal components? So yes, this M is the number of principal components that's in my model, right? But then how would I choose that? So let me just say that, you know, obviously the more, you know, principal components we have, right? Which is the same as saying the bigger that this number M is, the more accurately the projection will, you know, match the data, match or fit the data. And so kind of what you can make is a graph that looks like this. This is like saying, 
you know, if I have the number of components here, and on this axis is basically the sum of squared projection errors. Well, that graph will just keep on going down. And it'll go all the way down to zero, right? Because that it leaves blown. That uh, <laughs> covariance matrix is, you know, 768 by 768. And so it has, you know, all those eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And I could choose to use all 700 of them, and there wouldn't, be no, there wouldn't be any data compression in that case at all, right? But in practice, what we do is I say, okay, I want to choose my value of m in such a way that it accounts for some percentage of variance in my underlying data set, right? That's how I choose m, right? So the idea is to uh, choose a value of m that explains uh, some desired percentage of variance in the original data. Right? So you can show that the percentage of variance that is explained is just related to these lambdas. It's like saying, I look at the sum of these lambdas up to capital M, and I divide it by the sum of all of the lambdas. So this is like saying, you know, partial sum over, you know, the total sum. And so often what you say is, okay, I want to capture like 95% of the variance of the data which means I want to stop M when this fraction is above 95%, right? That will tell me how many components I need. And in fact, I did that over here in my example. I was kind of making a note up here of how far do I have to go to get 95% of the variance. And in this case, you can see that, you know, out of the original 768, you know, numbers, I was choosing 120 of those numbers, right? That would get me 95% of the way. In fact, here, you know, I'm only taking 10 of those numbers, which is probably quite a lot less than 95%. I don't know what the number is offhand, but I could compute it, right? Just be the sum of the first 10 eigenvalues over the total number, right? So that way, you know exactly what you should choose M to be to account for how much variation there is under the hood of your data, right? So it's a very cool idea. I've always liked PCA. It's a very simple idea. And then the nice thing about it is it actually like works and you can interpret it and understand it, right? So one thing that was very, um, you know, uh, popular back in the day was, and I'm going to actually maybe let this run for a second because it has to load data and do some stuff, right? But there was a concept called eigenfaces, right? So eigenfaces was basically, I thought there should be some sort of output for this. Uh, is there no plot? Hold on. Oh, no, there's a plot. It's just like down here. Yeah, here we go. So here's an example of saying, you know, there, there are tons of face recognition data sets out there, right? So here, this one, they tried to be very systematic in terms of everyone's wearing a white t-shirt, they're in front of a blank background, they're staring straight ahead, right? And then you can kind of discover, okay, so what is the, the mean face? The mean face looks like you know, some blurry person with dark hair and stuff like that. And then these are the first four principal components of the faces, right? Now, these are not necessarily very interpretable, right? Now, you might imagine that if you had, like, a bunch of examples of just one person, right, in different expressions or different orientations of their head, then maybe you would discover that the first principal component correspond to head orientation, and the second one correspond to whether you were smiling or frowning. You might hope to see some, some sort of things like that. But when you've got all these people in the data set, there's really not that much you can, like, look at this and say, oh, okay, that's what's going on, right? I mean, maybe, no, I'm not even going to hazard a guess as to what, what the PCA components tell us. But the point is that now I could use 67 numbers to represent whatever it was, 95% of the variation in the data. And these were originally, I think, 400 by 400 images, right? So that's like quite a substantial, um, you know, cutting down in terms of how much data I need, right? And then the way I would use it would be to say, okay, suppose I want to recognize pictures of of me, right? Well, I could build 
an eigenface model for either the whole population or I could build an eigenface model just for me and I could project the candidate image down onto this low dimensional subspace and I could look at the, just the differences between those numbers and that will be more uh, constructive than just looking at the sum of square differences between me and some candidate, right? Because the eigen decomposition takes into account this kind of like underlying orthogonal set of variations. Another example that I did for research, um, you know, quite a while ago was to a medical imaging situation, right? So I had these organ shapes, right? And the organ shapes were, you know, from people that had different body types and so on. So some people had smaller, these are actually prostates, right? So they're all men. Some of them had, you know, different shaped prostates. You know, they just look like these blobs, right? And so the question was, how can I represent what the, ab what the variation in prostates across the population looks like? And I did so with a PCA model, right? So here, this is something where what I'm doing is I am, uh, oh, you suck, cannot play media. I'll show you cannot play media. All right, so let's see. What if I try a different way? Cannot play media. All right, let's try it one more time. Don't save it. Sometimes this happens with uh, projection. Here we go. So here, what I'm doing is you can kind of see that there are little sliders that are going back and forth. And these are just the, the weight that I'm putting on each of the PCA modes, right? And so I can see that the first slider basically is, we're going to come back to the first slider in a second. The first one basically corresponds to kind of like the position of this shape. So it's changing both position and shape in a nonlinear way. Second one kind of corresponds to where it is in the body, left or right. Third one corresponds to how big it is like this. And the fourth one is maybe a little bit harder to interpret, right? But the idea is that now I have, for example, like a four dimensional model that can create this wire mesh shape of a complex organ, right? And so instead of trying to fit all the edges and points of this mesh to some sort of a, of a X-ray, like a CAT scan, all I have to do is I have to turn these four knobs to try to get the shape of this organ to look as close as possible to the data. So it's kind of like a problem like uh, this, where what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take what the doctors outlined, which is I believe in the uh, black, right? And what the shape model is able to accomplish, which is in yellow. And I'm trying to basically turn these four knobs for each patient in such a way that the yellow thing matches up as well as possible with the black thing. And this was a hard problem because these CAT scans were very uh, kind of grainy and the contrast is not very good. So there's no real edges that the model is able to grab onto. I didn't, I'm not going to talk about the segmentation problem. It's a whole, it's a whole thing. But that's the, that's the underlying thing is we have this four-dimensional model. And then the, the cool thing is that you could also do it with more than one uh, organ, right? So here I've got the, plos the prostate, the bladder, and the rectum, and the shape model is kind of allowing me to use a few knobs to move all these organs around simultaneously. So I can kind of see how these three organs jointly vary across the population. And so it would be much harder to try to specify each of these organs as, you know, 1,200 points sampled around the thing, fit this mesh somehow. So uh, it's a really simple idea, and it often works very well. So um, yeah, so let me, let me pause and ask questions or comments about, about this idea. Yep. You mentioned in that X new model, the one you showed a couple of uh, pages ago, you had uh, the latent variables. Which ones are the latent variables? The lambdas would be the latent variables, okay. right? So these coefficients, you know, would also be called latent variables. Those are the smaller set of numbers that control the big picture. OK, so it's a very simple idea. It's very cool. It's very easy to implement on your own. Um, and so let me just say a few more words about um, practicalities. Now, of course, when you, when you do this on the homework and you do it in real life, you just call PCA you know, using your package, right? There's no need to write the covariance matrix yourself and take the eigenvectors. I mean, you can, but you'll get exactly the same answer, right? So I'm not going to make you do that you know, necessarily. Um, but one thing to kind of keep in mind, and again, this is more for people who are interested in um, linear algebra, is that um, 
you know, in my, in my problem here, I had some very large dimensional space. Well, let's see. Let's think about this. So um, in practice, you know, the number of samples, which is given by n, may be less than the dimensionality d, right? So that's like saying, for example, suppose that I only had 40 examples of threes, and each of those examples was a 28 by 28 matrix. I would have fewer examples than the dimension of my data, right? So in that case, it doesn't make sense to do decomposition of the d by d matrix, because there are going to be lots and lots of zero eigenvalues. So in this case, basically, you know, it doesn't make sense to do the, you know, D by D eigen decomposition problem, right? Because that's a big, big matrix and I may not have that much data, right? Because, you know, D minus N of the lambdas will be zero. So it's like a lot of work computationally to find out that I have a bunch of zeros, right? So the idea is that instead of operating on this matrix, which is kind of like X, X transpose, that's how we formed the sigma, we can instead use X transpose X, right? So this is going to be a D by D matrix. This is going to be an N by N matrix. And so this has the same eigenvalues but different eigenvectors. So what I could do is I could find the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this smaller matrix and then uh, let u equal xv, right? So this is again going to be a um, d by n times n by 1. These are then the corresponding eigenvectors of this matrix, right? So it's kind of just like a, a little linear algebra trick to not do any more work than you have to, right? Again, under the hood, you don't really have to worry about this. And another thing that I would say is that, again, this comes back to something I did for research when I was a, an undergrad. You know, if I only need to compute, uh, you know, if I say in advance, okay, I, don't, I only want to have 10 dimensions in my model, right? I don't need to compute the entire covariance matrix and all the eigenvalues. This take the top 10, right? There are methods for just taking the top 10 eigenvalues without computing everything else, right? So there are also what are called um, power methods you know and there's a singular value decomposition etc if you're doing this efficiently you would probably use some smarter linear algebra and so if any of you are taking or want to take the numerical linear algebra class I'm sure they'll talk about the power method which has to do with if I only wanted to have the top eigenvector corresponding to the biggest eigenvalue how could I do that in an efficient way that doesn't require me to invert this massive matrix I always thought that stuff was really fun also. So if you're interested in a course like that, that's something to look into for next semester, right? And again, the SVD, the singular value decomposition, is something that's really important in linear algebra. But I'm pretty sure that most people who just took like our calculus class is not, are not going to have SVD, right? But the SVD is basically a way of talking about what can you do you know, if I have a non-square matrix, I can't talk about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that matrix. But the SVD is a way of talking about things that are kind of like eigenvalue and eigenvector-like for non-square matrices. And so it turns out that if I do PCA, it's just related to the SVD of this matrix by itself. I don't even have to form up the XX transpose. So again, this is all kind of just like a little bit beyond the point. But big picture, it's kind of interesting if you like linear algebra like I do, right? So another way that you can uh, discover the PCA subspace, which is kind of cool and relates back to neural networks, is what's called an autoencoder. So another way to discover the m-dimensional PCA subspace is to use an autoencoder.
An autoencoder is just a type of neural network that learns how to reproduce the data, right? So it's kind of a dumb neural network. So it's like saying, uh, you know, it's a special kind of neural network. So for example, what I do is I have the d-dimensional input. Then I have a hidden layer of, you know, m units. And then I have an output layer that is also d-dimensional. And then everything here is, you know, fully connected. So this is basically a fully connected network. It doesn't have any uh, activation functions, right? So basically, this is like saying that my output is exactly the same as the input. And also, I have in this thing, you know, no activation functions. What all that means is that I'm computing a linear relationship between the input layer, the hidden layer, and then another linear relationship to get the output layer. So the whole thing is linear, and that's exactly what PCA is doing, right? It's basically saying, give me a linear transformer of the data that is as good as possible, right? So what I do is I train the, you know, uh, network by saying, I want this to match up with this as well as possible. And then I learn these connections. When I'm done in the middle, I have these, uh, you know, M variables in the middle, which is kind of like the latent space, right? So if I look at the, you know, the linear transformations given by going from here to here and just throw away this part of the network, I've learned a transformation from d-dimensional space to m-dimensional space. So it turns out that if you, you know, uh, just train a neural network with backpropagation like this, the stupidest neural network that you could get, it will actually do the job of computing the PCA subspace by itself. Of course, these guys here, there's no guarantee that they're going to be perpendicular to each other in the same way that the PCA coefficients are. So like, again, for linear algebra people, these this linear mapping from here to here will span the same space as the M PCA vectors, but you have to do an extra step of making those vectors orthogonal if you want to. So if you, if you know about the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process, that's what you'd use to go from this subspace to an orthogonal subspace, right? So again, you know, this is a, you know, kind of a slightly different way of doing things. And the reason I'm mentioning is because autoencoders are super important also for generative modeling. We'll talk about that a little bit well, actually, I'll say, I'll say one more word about it in this class. We'll talk about it a little bit more in the generative AI lecture, right? So again, a kind of a cool linear algebra connection. So the last thing I want to say is, you know, what happens when you're pretty sure there is some sort of structure to your data, but it's not linear, right? So kind of a classic example is what they call the, you know, Swiss cake roll, right? So here, for example, let's suppose that your data you know, looked like this, right? So clearly, we can perceive that there's really only one dimension of variation along the line, and it's how far along the cake roll that I am, right? So if I gave you one number to represent the data, the number that I should choose would be how far along the curve am I, right? That would do a great job representing the data. However, PCA by itself would do a crappy job of representing the data, because here, this is almost like got the same variation in all directions, right? So my PCA axes would probably look like the X and Y axes, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't reduce the variance at all if I was forced to use orthogonal axes. There's no way I can turn this piece of paper in a way that does, makes the data look any better, right? So this is kind of like a nonlinear dimensionality reduction problem, right? So there are many methods for nonlinear dimensionality reduction. Right? And so 
I'm not going to talk about those methods in much detail here. I'm just going to give you a few bullet items, and you can look and find out this stuff later if you're interested. Again, possibly interesting as a project application, right? So if you want to try applying PCA to your data and then apply some nonlinear method that we didn't talk about in class, but is something you can look up, that may be a good thing that you can try for your project, right? So just kind of a quick note is that, you know, how do we deal with, with nonlinear stuff before? Well, the idea was that we took our input variables and we transformed them into some nonlinear space before doing something that was linear, right? So, you know, methods for this. And again, you can look more about this if you want. One is called kernel PCA. So you may remember the word kernel from the SVM lecture, right? So the SVM, again, was something where we talked about how you could have a linear SVM that would just be like finding a linear dividing line, or you could do SVM with this special kernel phi that was something that would now get you some sort of a weird decision boundary, right? So the basic idea is that instead of operating on x, you know, consider a nonlinear transformation like phi of x, and then do regular linear PCA on this covariance matrix that it now instead would look like you know, projecting things into the nonlinear space before computing the covariance matrix, right? So then you'd find the eigenvalues of this world, and then you'd map them back into the original space to find these kind of like nonlinear shapes. So you might be able to discover the Swiss cake roll in that way, right? So the clever thing is that, you know, like SVM, so like kernel support vector machines, the kind of neat trick is to operate with the kernel implicitly. What that means is that I specify a function that tells me the kernel you know, distance between two points. Like this is like a Gaussian kernel. Again, we're not going to talk about this in any extent, this class is just like, again, to whet your appetite. The Bishop book has more on kernel PCA if you're interested in, in how this works. But the clever idea is that, again, I don't, as a user, have to guess what a good fee is. I could just kind of specify some sort of a kernel function but in the original space that implicitly defines the kernel in the weird nonlinear space. Kind of in the like late 90s, early 2000s, there were also a bunch of cool algorithms. Like one was called multidimensional scaling. or MDS. So again, the basic idea was that we kind of let, you know, Y1 through Yn be a lower dimensional, what's called image of X1 through Xn. And kind of what I'm trying to do is, you know, we want to find a configuration of these y's so that yi minus yj is as close as possible to xi minus xj. So you kind of do this in a local neighborhood. In some sense, kind of what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to project some high dimensional data down into some low dimensional space. So for example, if I look at my cake roll again, what I might do is I might say, oh, you know, I look at this and I look at the distances between adjacent points, you know, and what I can try to do is I could unwrap the cake roll in such a way that if I unwrapped it onto a straight line, that this one dimension would do a good job of representing this dimension here, right? So you can kind of imagine that you might be able to discover some sort of a transformation from these black points to these red points. So the distances between the red points were as close as possible 
to the distances between the corresponding black points, right? So if any of you have ever done, um, like, there's a machine learning uh, visualization called TISNE, T-S-N-E. So um, my student is constantly showing me these plots called TSNE, which is basically like, again, he takes this high dimensional data that we have in our project and he maps it down into just a two dimensional plane for us to be able to tell how well separated the classes seem to be. And it's a quick visualization that is not like perfect, but it is kind of a little bit helpful to see are the classes all mixed together or are they kind of separable? And so there were a whole bunch of other like 2000s era algorithms like multidimensional scaling. There's something called isomap and something called local linear embedding. Again, this was stuff that was really hot when I was in grad school, but not so hot now. And the reason it's not so hot now is that the autocoder idea, the autoencoder that I talked about earlier, is really what drives modern latent variable models with nonlinearity, right? So the more modern way to do all this stuff is with a neural network. So a more modern, you know, dimensionality reduction. And again, PCA is still, I think, very useful. So I don't want to give you the impression that I'm teaching you something that, that you shouldn't think about using. PCA is still, I think, very important. Um, but you could have an autoencoder. Again, if I have, you know, like this, this is kind of like the same picture that I drew earlier. But what I may do is I may have, you know, five layers, for example, right? So I basically have, you know, input layer, output layer. The output layer is still trying to reproduce the input exactly, right? But I may have some, you know, like fully connected layers here with, you know, nonlinearities, the usual multi-layer perceptron. And again, I'm trying to train the output y to equal the input x, right? So all my input-output variables are just like, you know, try to represent the input. So, so what, what comes out of the network should be exactly what you put into the network. But along the way, you have crushed the you know, input down into this m dimensional latent variables. And so if I were just to kind of cut off the network at this point, this here would be like, you know, a, you know, compressor where I'm going from d variables to m variables. But because there are nonlinear activation functions, this is like a nonlinear transformation, right? I, I immediately lose the linearity as soon as I do my first ReLU or tan H or sigmoid or whatever at this point, right? So there's going to be some definitely confusing nonlinearity in this network. So these M numbers then can be thought of as some weird linear or some weird nonlinear transformations of the input data that still can be undone to get good representations here. So it's basically like you'd call this part a encoder. And then this part here would be like the decoder. And then these here would be what are called latent variables. And so you can think about this kind of like a nonlinear PCA. And so some of the first generative models were based on this kind of like idea of a what's called autoencoder. And there's also called a variational autoencoder, which I'll talk about like in my class next semester. But that's the kind of fundamental idea, right? Is that if I want to make a new human face, what I do is I sample randomly these M numbers and apply the decoder to make something that should look like a face, right? And hopefully it will make something that doesn't look like any of the faces that were in the training data set exactly, but kind of is choosing stuff from the same underlying distribution. So it's a kind of a cool underlying idea. And so yes, so that's, that's kind of like the, the thumbnail sketch of dimensionality reduction, which all starts with PCA, right? So what I'm asking you to do on the homework is, uh, you know, I can apply PCA anywhere where I feel like I want to kind of squeeze some of the useless data out or the, the useless dimensions out of my data before I apply the model, right? So, you know, basically, you know, we can apply PCA 
before you know any classifier right so for example what i might do is i might you know if i'm trying to classify you know these threes which are 28 by 28 or numbers right not just threes what i might do first is i might do a pca down to like a you know 30 by 1 vector Right? That captures some large variation in my threes, right? And then I might put this through like a neural network classifier, and then that gives me, you know, a decision from zero to nine, right? So I have saved myself from having to process these hundreds of data points by crushing it down to 30 dimensions before I put it through the classifier. And that's kind of what I'm asking you to do on homework four is the next thing we're gonna talk about on Monday is a thing called the decision tree, which is a super simple way of doing classification, but it's basically requiring me to do like a zillion branches along all the dimensions of my data, right? And if I have some massively high dimensional data, then I will save myself a ton of time by doing PCA first before applying this decision tree, right? And you can do that for anything, right? So again, something that might be useful for your project is to do you know, PCA before doing anything else just to see whether it makes a big difference in your results. Um, so questions or comments about PCA? Okay, the last thing I wanna say, which I realized is like core machine learning topic that I didn't cover yet, partially because it's so dumb and so easy, right? But I just have to say, I would be a bad machine learning teacher if I didn't tell you about the K-nearest neighbor classifier. I didn't know where else to put it in, so I'm putting it in today. So easy, I can explain it on one slide, right? So kind of the idea is that you have your classes, right? And so, you know, I have my space of classes. So here, each color represents a different class of data. Let's do some blue. I'm not sure I have too many colors, but some black. Thought I had a green marker here somewhere. And then let's take some green. Oh, I know a green marker today. Boo. Okay, so, ah, green. Okay, and then, so let's suppose that now I have this green point, right? So what I do with the green point is I say, okay, you know, um, how do I classify this green point? I basically, uh, you know, choose the majority label of the K nearest neighbors, right? So for example, if K equals one, I would just say, okay, well, this is the closest to a red point, right? So call it red, right? If K equals five, I'd say, okay, well, these five points are closest and three out of the five are red, so call it red, right? Um, if K equals three, you know, it's hard to tell. I probably would still have like two out of three are red, right? So it's the simplest classification algorithm that you could make. It doesn't have to have any sort of fancy neural network, no model or anything, right? It's just literally take the nearest thing, right? And if you wanna have it be more robust, you make K be a little bit bigger, right? That's all it is. It's, it's why I couldn't think about having like a whole lecture on K nearest neighbors, because right? I can explain it in two minutes. But I'm asking you to also apply this on homework four for the same data. And the thing is that you would be surprised how well it works, right? So it does work pretty well, depending on the way that your data is structured. So in a way, it's not a bad thing to just try k-nearest neighbors first before you do anything else, right? The downside of k-nearest neighbors is obviously that you have to keep all your data around, right? Which means that if I had like a million input data points in my training data, that I would need to have my model basically reproducing this entire training data data set everywhere I took it, right? So it's not a compact model at all because I've got all of that data hanging around every time I want to evaluate the model. The advantage of a more compact model like anything else we've talked about is that, you know, if I want to just do classification according to a logistic regression and classifier, I just have to, you know, save a bunch of coefficients on a line and not every data point that I ever saw, right? So that's the disadvantage of k-nearest neighbors is keeping all the data around. But again, it's always worth giving it a try to see how well it works. So there it is. I'm glad I stuck that into machine learning. Okay, any other questions or comments before we head into the weekend? <laughs>
All right, sounds good. 